We live already in highly coercive circumstances. A preciousness about sex that we need to dismantle. We actually have much deeper issues that need to be addressed. I'm opposed to the criminal law. I think we should abolish it. Everybody. Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we can bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I am Troy Polidori. And this week we have on Heidi Matthews, a professor at Osgood Law School at York University in Canada, who's going to chat with us about me too ism as she coins it or the me too moment or whatever as well as like sexual consent and various other things relating to that but before we do that we have to begin the podcast the way we begin every podcast with the uh shitty minute this is the part of the podcast where one of us rants about whatever it is that's grinding our gears in the last week or so so austin besides the fact that it's literally 3 a.m right now it's 3 a.m. In in Sydney, that is. You're a dick. <laughs> what's, uh, what's got you down? So last week you said that yours was, or last episode, yours was uh, more plebeian. Uh, and then I talked about fireworks and my sticky leaves. Well, this time I'm going to bring the heat with something super serious. And I figured we could just talk about it for a couple of minutes. And I know that this episode is now long and it's three in the morning. And we said we would kind of like try and keep this snappy and short. But I already chose my my fucking shitty minute. So you got to just bear (laughs) with me. And but I wanted to talk about uh, locking humans in cages. Oh, shit. And how it's being justified by evangelicalism and something you said to me on Twitter that you said, can you imagine how easy it would be to sort of remove yourself from the evangelical community if we were still fully immersed in it based on the bullshit that we've seen evangelical support over the last year? That's my shitty minute, man. My shitty minute is that I just cannot believe that even if it's a minority contingent, like with regards to kids being you know, removed from their families and, and put into these internment camps— even if it's a minority of American evangelicals, I cannot believe the uh, j- just the 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 position of so-called American Christians or so-called Christians, let's say, in America that are supporting some of these policy proposals or um, that are supporting some of the things that we're seeing them support. Ever from everything from like our old president of the university that we attended supporting Trump um, to Jeff Sessions justifying locking kids in cages by citing Romans 13. It's it's honestly unfucking real. And I don't know, man. I mean, it, it makes me literally think that, okay, that's the final straw in the camel's back of my attachment to American Christianity. You know? Like, that's it. Like, fuck you guys. No wonder people think that you're assholes because you are. This isn't Christianity. Or this this is Christianity. It's a type of Christianity, but this isn't Jesus at all. This isn't the prophetic message. This isn't Isaiah or Jeremiah weeping and screaming about inequality and impiety. This is this is not that at all. This is just complete self-justified political exploitation. Yeah, and I think the important point is it's neither a policy proposal. Because it's literally happening, right? Right, um, right. And it's not even law. And it's not I mean, even a law. It doesn't even have to happen. Yeah. It's a pure, pure choice. And then also, um, not only is it not even a policy proposal, it's a literal reality that's happening. It doesn't have to happen in any way. It's purely based upon choice. But also, it's not like it's some kind of obscure, indirect mechanism by which terrible negative things happen. So you can imagine... Um, like I'm trying to think of like what would be an example of a really kind of obscure tenant, like uh, like poverty reduction, right? So lot, lots of evangelicals are, are, are sort of align themselves with more conservative issues on taxes and welfare and stuff, right? And that has really negative effects, I think, and it's really bad. But 
it's kind of indirect. And so you could you could kind of convince yourself that, you know what, these people have wrong ideas, but they're not like inherently evil, right? They don't mm. like it when people are in poverty and suffering. They just think that this is not the way to solve that. And I think they're wrong about that. But that's, that's right. sort of their mental state, right? This is literally people who defend this stuff aren't just defending a talking point so they can sort of, you know, establish their identity as a conservative or whatever. This is like literally looking at a horrendous evil being perpetrated and then just saying that, yeah, I'm cool with that. Like that's, that's appropriate. That's just, yeah. What do you, what do you even do with that? I think if, if someone affirms that they're, they're kind of just, my intuition is to say that they're just lost. Like they're, Mm. you don't really, it's like an unforgivable sin type of thing that happens in the gospels, right? Like Mm. uh, blaspheming the Holy spirit. Like it's like, what do you even, how do you come back from that? I guess you can, I, I, I hope you can, but I don't know how you talk to somebody who says that. Yeah, yeah. How do you talk to somebody? Because I, I'd i be really curious to see what is it about that person's epistemological makeup, the, the, the framework by which they interpret the world, analyze the world, assess the world, appropriate information. I'd be curious because it seems like the mechanism by which they do all of that stuff is broken, <laughs> you know? Like... Like there's something faulty going on there, and and I don't mean that in a literal sense. Like somehow the machinery is actually broken, like the wires don't function. But I mean that more metaphorically. That there's some sort of stopgap that is that that is preventing what seems to be quite apparently an evil, like you just said. But nevertheless, because it confirms a certain political bias or ideological bias, then they just post hoc justify it by invoking God, which I don't know. I mean, it just makes me think that, and I don't know, I have a strange relationship with Christianity still, and and, and I don't know exactly how I think about all of this, but I, I do think that if the God of the Bible is real, he's fucking pissed at this. There's no way, right? This God of the Bible or this God of the universe even, let's say. Like, fuck, even if it's not the God of the Bible as interpreted through Orthodox Christianity, but maybe the God, uh, the the absolute, the substance, um, the, the, the universality that the Bible is attesting to, that maybe other world religions also attest to. If that God has some sort of conscious awareness and isn't just like, I don't know, energy or whatever fucking hippies want to talk about, um, that that consciousness is fucking angry. That's what it makes me think. Now, I don't know if that argument has much weight because I don't even know if I necessarily buy. I think there's some problematic, some problematic um, philosophical reasons to dispute that that's a, 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 an adequate conceptualization. But you know what I mean? It, it just makes me think that even if you're going to buy into the Christian narrative, how the fuck can you buy into these activities? It just doesn't vibe at all. Yeah, I mean, my intuition would be to say that they just don't believe it. Like, an actual, mm. an actual, they might say they do, right? But they don't, and they may even think they do in a weird kind of meta way, but they don't actually believe that, right? Because this is like pure tribalism, right? It's like, I, I just don't like these people so they can suffer, even if they're children. Don't really give a shit. Which is really ironic, right? Because, I mean, we, we were in evangelical college, and during that time, postmodernism was the big boogeyman that was going to ruin culture and it was the big enemy of christianity and all this kind of stuff right and one of the big arguments was that postmodernism sort of erases the idea that there's some absolute moral truths and so when we do that we're going to go down this realm of relativism and no one will care about morality anymore and society will degrade and we'll all fall apart in a sex orgy and then die from syphilis or whatever um (laughs) but then who in the in the words of like you know big lebowski like who are the fucking nihilists here right mm. i mean it seems like the evangelicals have become the nihilists all of a sudden like they don't really believe in anything it's all just proceduralism it's all just we have certain goals fewer immigrants how are we going to achieve that whatever means necessary even if it means doing horrendous evils in the process it's worth mm. it uh, follow the law because it's the law that's romans 13 being used as a bludgeon rather than as a nuanced sort of moral argument it's Christianity as Machiavelli. Yeah, which is like, what What the fuck? I guess it's always kind of been that way. And so we're being naive if we think it's a new thing, but it's really naked right now. Like, it's really just like, they're not even mm. pretending, 
right? Yeah, that's the crazy Why thing. Why is it moral to lock up kids? Well, because Romans 13, because the government says so, like pure naked power. This is this so this is what Zizek talks about as being the the different way that we understand ideology now, right? Like it used to be you don't know that you're doing it, but you do it anyway. Now it's you know that you're doing it, but you do it anyway. And it's just blatant disregard. Yeah, I don't know. And it's weird. I mean, I don't know if you still have any sort of attachment, but I still have, you know, that that guilt, that that Christian guilt that pops up, you know, and and part of me thinks that when I when I get angry and I'm just like, fuck you all motherfuckers. This is why people aren't Christians. Fucking who cares? Then immediately part of me is like, oh, but is it? You know, what if, you know, maybe did he really raise from the dead? Like th- that shit. I don't know if that specter is ever going to go away. You know, I still I still battle with that. And so I have a very complex relationship with the Christian tradition. And and when stuff like this happens, it it definitely pushes me in a particular direction. That is for fucking sure. Mm-hmm. You know, it it's nails in the coffin. But then, of course, a fucking finger keeps popping up out of the coffin every once in a while. <laughs> but I don't know if it's just because it's the muscles twitching after the head got cut off or if the corpse is actually alive. I don't know. Yeah, dude. I mean, I asked you that question on Twitter about can you imagine if we were back in school right now and this was all happening, how much easier it would have been to just transition out? And that was more me just trying to find some like solace through this whole process right like maybe mm. somewhere someone is like benefiting in an indirect way from this happening and is finding an easy way out of like a terrible community they've mm. become involved in um it, w- it would be fascinating though right to go into mm. these circles and like find out what the discussion points are is it purely just naked power and there's no actual like moral reasoning behind it or are are people like I don't even know what I can't even imagine what the discussions would actually be like the good faith discussions if they actually exist or is it just that no one has good faith discussions about this like because you just can't right <laughs> so you right. just like avoid it at all costs like, there's no classrooms anywhere at evangelical colleges where people are talking about this because you just feel like you can't <laughs> yeah and I wonder and this was my reply to you on Twitter I wonder how many people if you could like even quantify this is how many people have actually since, say, uh, the evangelical church totally aligned with Trump, and then you kind of just keep adding all of these things up, and then now you have this shit with Sessions. How many Christians are like, oh, you know what? That's it, man. I am going full on, maybe I'm going to join an Anabaptist community, or I'm going to go to the social justice church down the street, but maybe I just am done completely. Like, how many people are actually being pushed out of of these communities where they had previously been raised or found comfort or maybe were converted into later in life. How many of them are like, fuck these people, man. This is not what I'm reading in the Bible. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, like neither of us are, right? But I wouldn't right. be surprised if this is the end of evangelicalism. Not in the sense that... That's what I've been wondering. That, it, that it's going to be gone, but that yeah, it's yeah. now become completely identified with the political movement and the social right. movement that is, you know, kind of Trump taking over the GOP in the same way. There really aren't never Trumpers. Like there's a couple of people who like write in the, in the New York times. Right. But they, it's not a, a movement. It has no um, existence outside of a couple individuals saying certain things. It's not like an actual existing phenomenon. Evangelicalism might also be that way. Eventually. I feel like, and that mm. it's just going to be completely subsumed by the Trump movement. And then its existence outside of that is just like purely epiphenomenal and doesn't really actually affect anything because everyone will either leave it or completely identify with the Trump stuff. Wow. Like, how could you yeah, not, it's... right? At this point. Yeah. Fuck, man. I don't know. I don't know. It is crazy, though. But yeah, I mean, that that was my shitty minute this week. I, I figured we'd be able to at least kind of, like you say, have some sort of solace. We could, we could commiserate with one another for a minute i know man we probably have to do an episode on this at some point yeah. someone someone out there needs to write an article an important article about evangelicalism and the concentration camps and then we'll talk about it yeah if anyone out there knows of any good articles actually hit us up on twitter and share it with us because that would actually be a pretty interesting topic for a future episode yeah.
All right, cool. So we are going to jump straight into our main segment now. And as we said at the outset, we have a guest this week. And as we kind of had been forewarning for a couple of weeks before she bailed on us, she uh, she was trying to come and, and hang out. But it's Heidi Matthews who is going to come and talk with us about consent and sexuality and Me Too and who knows where the conversation is going to go. So hello, Heidi. How are you? Hi, good. Thanks so much for having me. Before we jump into anything, do you want to just give a brief little bio and bam yourself up a little bit before we get into the talk? Uh, so who I am, I guess. I uh, am an assistant professor of law at um, Osgoode Hall Law School, which is uh, in Toronto. Um, and I teach and research primarily in the areas of um, international law and the law of war. Um, and, I, and also the law of sexuality and um, very much at the intersection of those two points as well. And, uh, but my current research project is trying to figure out, um, it's a book project, it's a trade book project, and it's really trying to map political theory of sex uh, in part, certainly inspired by, I don't want to say in reaction to the Me Too moment, but certainly, certainly inspired by that uh, and the conversations that have been going on over the last um, five months or so. Okay. And you've, so you've written a few interesting publications recently. There's one that recently came out with Eon that is titled, How Do We Understand Sexual Pleasure in the Age of Consent? Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. Can you just kind of sum up what your basic argument was in the article? Sure. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's a short piece. Um, it's, a, it's a provocative piece. It's certainly meant to be. It's trying to do a couple of different things, um, sort of, I, I think, to map out, uh, in part, the relationship between cultural or social normative shifts and... Um, and the pressures or demands of the law. So a lot of what we've seen in this Me Too thing, and I'm reticent to call it a, a movement because um, I don't think it is, but a lot yeah. of what we've seen is a, a sort of a demand for cultural change um, and this paradoxical embrace of the law as, uh, as an avenue for change, but also um, an obstacle to change. So, uh, so there's a weird call by many feminists to reform the law in some respects. So to change uh, consent provisions in the law of rape and sexual consent, or sorry, sexual mm. assault. And but on the on the other hand, also a real rejection of of the capacity of law to affect cultural and social change. So the piece attempts to grapple with that. Um, but I think in terms of the consent part of it, it's really trying to, to um, it's really poking, po trying to poke holes, um, effectively, I think, in uh, the discourse of consent as a sort of assumed relevant, um, not only relevant, but but sort of space for answering the question of what to do with, with sex assault. And so the general presupposition within feminist discourse um, both academically, but also extraneous to that, right? So just in the in the general space of public discourse at the moment is to, is to think that we can answer um, issues raised by Me Too just by turning to consent and uh, really reifying it or reinscribing it um, even more stringently than than we currently have it. And I'm objecting to that on the basis that one, I don't think it reflects reality. Um, brackets, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to sexual interactions, too, um, I think actually a lot of the ways in which um, asserted reforms, so in particular with respect to what's known as affirmative consent, um, or even more serious than that, what's known as enthusiastic consent, are actually really potentially dangerous policy shifts, um, or would have dangerous uh, practical and material consequences from a policy perspective. And then also I want to explore maybe the more, the most controversial, let's say, piece of it is to explore um, the range of experience that has to do with unwanted, uh, in other words, non explicitly non-consensual sexual activity um, as being not necessarily um, a normatively bad thing and actually potentially um, a site of uh, a resource site really for figuring out um, productive um, left-wing politics. That makes sense. By unwanted, do you mean just things that are unfamiliar? No. Not 
not forcible, but but things that are unfamiliar, therefore they're unwanted because you didn't know that you wanted it or that you might find some sort of site of pleasure in this new domain? Or what do you mean by unwanted? Yeah, so so there's a bunch of stuff uh, potentially going on there. One um, is the idea that you can actually, one can actually discover what one wants in the moment, right? And so the idea of consent, like as a, as a construct in law, uh, but also just in theory, um, is that it relates uh, to a transactional moment, right? So the idea that we, uh, and right. so this is not unique to sexual relations. It's like a core concept in contract law, um, all, their, all the other sorts of um, legal provisions as well. But it's the idea that actually, you know, as autonomous human beings who are in some sense um, uh, in charge of, you know, a, 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 an amount of agency in the world, despite the fact that that agency may or may not be, you know, constrained in various sorts of ways. We have some agency and ideas that we can sort of predict in advance what we want. And so part of the objection is to say, yeah, that is sometimes true, but there's also the possibility of figuring out what you want, as it were, um, in the moment, right? So in the unfolding of events. So that's one sense um, in, which, in which we can talk about um, non-consensual activity. But the objection obviously there is, right, that the moment you discover it's wanted, it becomes consensual, right? Yeah, but I mean, is it, so is there already like a sort of trust that allows the pursuit of experimentation prior to that? And would that not count as like a formal consent that then the content yeah. kind of fills in the gaps? So if you're with your partner and you like are like, hey, I trust you, you trust me, or even if it's not like a partner that you've established clear guidelines with, but there's already mm -hmm. some sort of recognition of, comfort to experiment, then right. it's sort of like free game. Is that kind of what you're saying? Or is it something even more radical than that? I mean, so that's part of it. Okay. And even so I think it's important to point out that like from the from the perspective of of the law and the Me Too business, that's already really problematic. Right. So okay. um, because uh, it doesn't map onto to um, requirements for expression of consent that makes sense right so the law is going to want to be able to pinpoint like okay um at what what point can we say that consent appeared or vanished or reappeared but i think it's actually okay. there's so in part that's so that's already problematic from the point of view of the law but um but you're right that actually there's a more radical and even more radical part of it which um is to say that i think there are instances in which you know trust I mean, that's a complicated concept, obviously, but trust as we currently understand it, especially in sort of just um, mainstream discourse, you know, may not be present and the activity can still be productive and not necessarily normatively undesirable, right? Mm. So, and it depends on how you can, how you construe force, right? I think that's a really interesting question, right? right? So, so there's all sorts of different kinds of force. I mean, I think... You know, the under sort from my theoretical approach to all of these questions um, assumes that we live already, like always already in highly coercive circumstances. Right. Um, and right. so everything about our life is const our lives are constrained is constrained um, by various sorts of coercion, whether they're socioeconomic or you know, or become, uh, you know, or involve a bomb being dropped on your head in a, in a situation of armed conflict, right? Those, there's one, you know, there, there's a huge spectrum of cons constraint and coercion, but we, we exist always in highly constrained circumstances. So, um, so that animates part of this project, right? Because, because part of the consent discourse um, uh, is sort of seeking freedom, as it were, without taking into consideration um, the coercion that's already in play. That makes sense. So this is kind of the external, we're talking here about the external coercive factors, right? You also mentioned a second ago that that was pretty interesting to me, the idea that we can kind of discover maybe what we want or desire in the moment and those things are in flux and change. Is there is there some kind of like underbelly there of sort of rejecting maybe the traditional liberal subject that's fully transparent to themselves, knows exactly what their desires are and seeks to fulfill them in a marketplace? Like is that whole that sort of larger um, subjective picture also under criticism? Yeah, view? absolutely. So I think, so I'm working from uh, like within a tradition that you guys are both familiar with, right? But as, as a, you know, whatever, loosely speaking, some kind of post postmodern tradition where, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not buying um, liberal subject as a, uh, a workable 
or desirable mode of thinking through these problems, right? So yeah, it's a really helpful way of putting it. I think this project is sort of, um, it's just one example of the way in which we can uh, challenge uh, the viability of the liberal subject, which by the way, is the only subject that's known to us within Western liberal democracies, right? Like that's the subject that the law is working with. And every aspect mm. of the law is is based on that on that sort of subjectivity, which is, of course, highly problematic. Yeah. It, it's interesting because it seems like, I mean, there are a few things going on here, obviously, but there's the level of, like, the theoretical or the level at norms, and then there's the level of actual jurisprudence, which this is the one that really confuses me because <laughs> I'm a philosopher, I'm doing work in political economy, so it's much easier for me to to be comfortable at the level of concepts and the level of theory and even the level of activism. But when you actually talk about, like, instituting laws or or even like from a position of critical legal studies like unpacking laws and rethinking laws I, I find the the bridge between the two to be very difficult because how the fuck do you advocate for the institution of like politico juridical structures without just falling into biopolitical management or something along those lines that I just automatically am like, well, do we need more control? Do we need more restriction and limitation and um, and sort of constitutive power structures imposed on us? So how do you navigate that gap? Right. So a lot of so a lot of the response to this work, which is um, of course emergent and in progress, but a lot a lot of the response has been to say, okay, well. You've got uh, this thoroughgoing critique of, of consent and the role it plays in, in law, but in particular, um, the law of sexual assault. But, uh, you know, it might be the case that that's the best paradigm, uh, for lack of a better word, that we have to work within, right? Um, and that may be true, right? At the end of the day, one might do this analysis and from like a, a sort of just material distribution of power perspective, it might be that there isn't anything else better. Right. Like, I'm not willing to say um, that we don't know that at this present moment, but I reject the idea that you need to 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 it, that in order to enter this debate um, in the way that I'm proposing we do, that you need to come with some kind of law reform project. So it's really, really, really not a part of 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 this project to, um, you know, be, to involve the idea that I've got to have some kind of like answer at the end of the day, right? I, I think that that's mm. anti-intellectual, um, but it's important to point that out because especially within that, I know that this is not your wheelhouse disciplinarily, but um, but it's really common in general uh, traditional orthodox legal or uh, legal um, scholarship, right? To basically, you know, to mention a problem you know, there's this thing, there are issues, whatever, and here's a solution, right? And doing the opposite is really, really uh, very much a heterodox positionality to take, right? So mm. so saying that actually I want to do this inquiry without having a prepackaged idea of what a better um, solution would be is is um, something that legal scholars are not very comfortable with. And certainly activists themselves, like you mentioned activism, activism, a lot of activism is premised on the notion that we need to do policy reform. I mean, we may, we may well need to do policy right. reform, right? But there's a lot of um, conceptual work uh, that goes, by the way, the conceptual work goes along with mapping the material distributive consequences of all of this as well, right? Is there like a Hippocratic oath for <laughs> the legal, for like the legal <laughs> profession, you know, where it's like, like, you know, doctors are like, ah, oh, we, we promise to not do harm or whatever the fuck it is. Is there like, is there yeah. like a formal structure that, typical, let's say, orthodox legal scholarship tries to abide by? And, and if so, what is the formulation? Is it like, we will only work with laws that restrict harm? So like kind of social contract shit? Or is it more utilitarian? Like what, what, how, That's what is really the formal principle? a really fascinating question. That's super interesting question. That's really, really cool. I like that a lot. That's great. So <laughs> Yeah, that's really cool. So incidentally, I also teach a course called Ethical Lawyering in a Global Community. You can imagine that. So, <laughs> and the course, the course basically combines, it basically combines um, uh, the required class that law students will have to do uh, on professional ethics, right? Um, with okay. some kind of commitment to this notion that uh, there's something to the idea of global citizenship, right? So, so that um, it's not just about what you're doing within the governmental structure that's been set up by your state and the role of law in that, but actually that's broader than that. So it's a really interesting combination of those two impulses. 
I mean, I should say the following, and this this will condition sort of uh, or help help people understand sort of where I'm coming from. So I am not actually a lawyer, despite the fact that I spent something like 11 years in law school, right? <laughs> and I'm like like four law degrees or something like this. Like I didn't, I didn't, yeah. So I never wrote, I didn't, I never wrote a bar and that was like an over, you know, a conscious political decision on my part. So I'm not bound by personally by any of the, um, uh, professional ethics codes, um, that as, as exist, uh, as, uh, disciplinary technologies for the profession. Right. But, but lawyers are of course bound by those codes and those codes are specific to the jurisdictions that people are working in. Um, and so for example, the American approach is very, very, um, code based. So there are a whole bunch of, in general, it's true that with respect to the legal profession in the U S there's a whole bunch of really, um, detailed and finite provisions that need to be uh, followed um, from an ethics perspective, right? And then um, I'm a Canadian, I so I studied in the U.S. for many years, but I live and teach in, in Canada now. Um, and our approach is a lot more aspirational or deontological in the sense that we have broad provision, broad ideas about um, what in, in integrity and ethics might look like in the profession and then um, working out what those mean uh, in a specific application um, would be a question for each individual, and then in the in the context of a dispute for the professional regulatory body to work out, right? But um, but yeah, in general. Uh, so what's interesting is that the sort of main overarching idea, though, in those professional codes is that um, you're doing your job as a legal advocate um, when you are adequately representing the will of your client. Right. And this, um, for obvious reasons, can come up against a whole host of um, of other competing ethical commitments. But it's it's not the sort of do no harm thing. It's really the it's really enveloping this idea of the liberal subject that you mentioned earlier. Right. So we just do what your client tells you within the boundaries of what's legally permissible, which is flexible. Um, and that's sort of the primary commitment. I have to ask, I'm curious, mm -hmm. sometimes philosophers have to teach this class called business ethics, oh God. where you're a philosopher <laughs> and you have, you have zero interest in business or experience in business, and you have to take a bunch of business majors and basically teach them how not to like, fuck up their employees real bad or get arrested or get tar and feathered socially. And so the students are always super apathetic, and they have no desire to do any of this because they know it's purely formulaic and doesn't actually right. give them any skills necessary to succeed. And the professors and instructors usually absolutely abhor the idea of dealing with these issues. Um, I have to imagine, though, that your ethical lawyering class is a different phenomenon, or do you see some of the similarities? Um, so it's a weird thing. I mean, partially, so there, this is, this class is, um, and it's not unique to my school. I think this is true, like, in every law school that I've operated in, you know, which includes uh, the UK and continental Europe as well, right? So... <laughs> So in general, yeah, um, in general, these classes are like structured such that they are like kind of separate from the regular curriculum, which I think is initially problematic because it sets up a situation where students think that it's not as important as, you know, learning the bare bones of tort law or whatever. So, um, so like, for, so our, my class is, is a, is a um, condensed class that we teach like during the first two weeks of law school. Right. And then they like, like, don't return to it <laughs> until the next term. And they like do real law, you know, in the interim, which which um, <laughs> can be problematic because it does produce a sense of, um, you know, disinterest, disinterest rather or ennui with respect to ethics. Um, and also the sense that it's really, you know, it encourages the idea that there's a really that there's some kind of sharp distinction between learning doctrinal law, which which students do in first year without a lot of theory. Um, and learning uh, and thinking about ethical conundrums. On the other hand, they're like really worried about liability. So, you know, they, they, they are worried about being dragged up in front of the law, the, the law society, you know, for having, having violated provision because there's a lot of crazy stuff that in theory can happen, right? If a complaint is made. So, so it's both a sense of like interest and fear um, and also the sense that, you know, they just really want to get on with the job of learning law and doing well in law school. So get a job at a corporate law firm so it's a mix <laughs> yeah yeah so would you say then so then it, you're kind of like the uh you're like the crazy wild philosopher that has all of these 
bright-eyed, naive, future, legal, uh, like actual lawyers, and your job is to basically put the seed of doubt in their mind. Is that kind of what you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I think so. And that's, that's, so that's true. And I think that that's divorced, divorced, but it's not necessarily related to this this issue of teaching ethics, right? So, so my, so I spend actually a lot of the, a lot of time in the class, not going into um, the detail of the professional codes, although they're important and we do talk about it. Um, You know, anyone can find the rules and you can read those cases, but I spend a lot of time actually trying to unpack or disabuse rather students of assumptions that they have about the nature and role of law in society when they come to law school. Right. Um, right. Because they just, they have all sorts of thoughts about, about what it is and what it's supposed to do and about whether it's a good bad, and bad thing and what its relationship may or may not be to political authority and this kind of stuff. So I do do a lot of, um, a lot of, yeah, disabusing stuff about the potential goodness of yeah. the law. So asking, so asking a big question then, what do you think the law is supposed to do? And then in tying that in relation to this issue of right. sexual consent or sexual practices and things like that, what? what is the role of the law now kind of moving into this more concrete constructive like what it sense. should be yeah i mean look i think i think the law the law is a tool of power right it's not not no more or less than that um and people in the world you guys as as philosophy teachers me as a law teacher and some sort of public intellectual and you know, whoever we, whoever interacts with the law, politicians who who create the law, um, in the sense of legislating it, or judges who create the law in the sense of creating judicial president, and whatever. Like we're all political actors um, with project. Like I'm stealing this I, this 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 framing, which I always found very helpful. That one of my graduate school professors did. He would always ask, you know, okay, don't look at the doctrine first. Ask who's acting here and what their political commitments are like substantively. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and that is what I'm interested in. And then the law comes in as a way of implementing a project basically. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't, and I don't think it should, it should be any more or less than that. So the idea, you know, so this, this is um, especially from an American. So you guys being Americans, I think you can relate to, or tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I had a sense, I, uh, it, I have a sense that in America, um, the uh, public consciousness around the role of the Constitution, for example, elevates it to a level of normative unquestionability that for me is anathema to the way in which we actually should look at the law and how it helps us to organize our lives politically, right? In other words, there's nothing particularly special about mm. the Constitution as a document. In fact, it's actually quite a bad Constitution. <laughs> in many ways in how it sets up government but there's this notion that it's it's you know unquestionable um but also embodies uh can sort of answer all of our questions but also embodies a set of universalizable norms right Mm -hmm. um that i actually object to like what oh just the idea that um you know um so another another way of getting at that is like human rights doctrine will say that all you know all men whatever are created equal and endowed with a set of inalienable rights i mean i don't think that's true right? like rights so right rights right, rights are a technology of um of uh liberalism right um and they've got a whole host of of um, upsides and downsides, but what they do is they allow us to parcel out power in society, right? That's all they do. It's mm. not. It's not that you know they're real in any sense. But more than that, it's certainly not the case that they're actually absolute. We choose to make them more or less real in different circumstances, right? But it's always a political choice. Mm. And so that conception of law as being this, this kind of neutral tool of power is that also morally neutral then? Because it could be used for either good or bad totally. ends, right? Absolutely. So we're not making any sort of moral judgment about it that way. Totally. Yeah, yeah. No, the law, like, this is the thing, right? Like, law as such doesn't really have any moral content, right? So, like, the idea that every that everyone, you know, has the, um, whatever, right to life, liberty, and security of the person, right? Like, obviously, that's got some, you know, we assume that that's got normative import. But actually, it doesn't mean anything until you sit down and try and figure out um, what that, how that should be applied in a particular circumstance. And when it comes to a legal dispute, it means that one party is going to lose 
and another party is going to win. In other words, the power of parties relative to one another is going to, is going to shift and it's not going to be equal. Um, so yeah, the, there's lots of normativity in law, but the normativity comes in from the substantive uh, distributional perspective, right? So from the perspective of like, okay, who actually is coming out of this dispute resolution process with more power um, in society um, that is sanctioned by law. So it's a job of law to sanction power. Okay. And so that's then where the ultimate fear comes in with regards to the Me Too, I think you referred to it as a moment earlier, um, or the sort of, let's say, the, 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 mean, the Me Too framing of things is that it's, it's operating at this level of power, but what your concern ultimately is, is how are we going to distribute that power? How are we going to, um, and I mean distribute in kind of both the, the how are we going to, how are we going to spread it out, dole it out, but then simultaneously, how are we going to delineate it within its various sort of like networks? Is that correct? Yeah, totally. And that's true for all areas of law, right? But I mean, I, but that kind, that sort of discussion is like uniquely absent right now because we're, we're given to believe, um, uh, that, uh, taking power away from individuals by, you know, the most extreme end of it, imprisoning, right? Although that is the most extreme end of it, um, in this context of sexual assault is automatically going to shift women's, and it is women that we're talking about, right? Is going to necessarily shift women's power situation in society in a positive direction. And I just don't think that's true. Right. I think that's an argument. Yeah. It might be true. Um, but it's an argument that needs to be actually made as opposed to simply asserted. Right. See, now I have, um, I have, it's a sort of unformed opinion, but I have this fear that, 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 that the, the paradigmatic logic that is driving much of this, um, this culture, let's say around mm -hmm. hashtag me too, mm -hmm is actually conditioned by what J.K. Gibson Graham referred to as a capitalocentric logic. And what I mean by that is it seems that it – capitalism does a bunch of things. But if capital is excellent at anything, the one thing is excellent at doing is the sort of equivalence or the generalization or the reification of difference into sort of equal units or quantitative um, units of measure – and then that's what allows for transaction to take place on the market, right? And um, mm -hmm. and so my concern is is that is that this idea of consent takes place at the level of exchange value as a transactional exchange, right. rather than some sort of reciprocal activity that exists excessive of that capitalistic exchange logic. And I think. And I'm not quite sure how to articulate that. I don't know if that's too theoretical and abstract, but does that does that make sense with what I'm saying? No, I like that. I really like that. That's really helpful. Um, so yeah, so one example, and I mentioned this, this in one of the pieces. Um, so it, 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 you know, there are different, obviously many, many, many um, different kinds of sexual interaction. And some sexual interaction is marketized, right? So sex work, for example, um, might be, it might be the case, and I, I tend to think it's more likely than not, that within, like from a labor perspective, sex work, um, sexual interactions that are explicitly based on market exchange, right? Although depending on where you are, the law deals with that in more or less problematic ways. But that's kind of a scenario where um, assuming that we're okay with the idea of, of of markets and whatever, I mean, big assumption, but imagine that that's in play. It might be the case that that sort of transactional, transactional sex actually makes the most sense. Like that's the area in which that sort of trans, like capitalocentric, yeah. say, like where that sort of interaction would make sense and is actually something that perhaps we would want to use the law to um, protect, right? Mm -hmm the capacity to make those sorts of exchanges. And most legal systems now do the opposite. They don't protect that sort of capacity to make sexual exchange. Um, they ostensibly protect other sorts of capacity uh, to have sexual interaction nominally within the private sphere, mm. right? So non-monetized, non non-marketized, non-capitalized, you know, according to the traditional story, areas of sexual interaction. So that kind of thing I don't have a problem with in the realm of sex work. 
necessarily, but I think it's obviously problematic when we when we use it to think about about um, private, as it were, interaction. Yeah, I mean, would you right. would you say that? L- because the system is the way that it is now, we need to protect workers as best we can. These are individuals who are still yeah. having their labor. They're, they're still working, but they're kind of working on the fringes and they don't have the protections that um, sort of legal businesses, let's say, have uh, yeah. as as market actors. Therefore, if we're going to have a market society, then all market actors need to be protected. They're market actors. Therefore, they need to be protected. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I actually I actually think like, so I didn't quite state it correctly just now. I think, I think that the idea, the paradox of all of this is that we're applying this market logic in the so-called sphere of private sexual interaction when in reality we, we should be applying it like to the actual market of sexual interaction if that makes sense yeah that's that's the other thing too is i think that that that, that this capitalocentric logic actually exists even if i go to a bar tonight and i pick up a girl i've got a certain yeah. amount of sexual capital and i'm going to use that to kind of create a transactional uh, accord with her and then hopefully she's going to reciprocate and there's going to be an exchange right i mean that's the way that it that's the yeah. way that it works so there's still a sort of marketized logic that's even impinging on our quote unquote private sexual behaviors so no i think i think it's i think it's stronger than that right i think that we have an intense so here's what so my my intuition here is that we have an intense marketization attitude towards those sorts of of quote unquote private encounters right. um uh but because we it's i mean it's a really fucked up kind of thing because we exceptionalize sex as something that should be kind of outside the market when it is actually inside the market we're not applying that stuff but i think we're being encouraged in particular in the present moment we're being encouraged to think about all private sexual interactions in terms of yeah this like weird idea of of exchange one-to-one exchange and transaction um and attached to that is the idea that you know this basic contract law idea that it's actually possible to have a, a meeting of the minds with respect to what's expected um, to occur within a sexual interaction. Right? Okay. Now, I, I mean, are are you not worried though that that if if everything is coercive and Troy and I talk a lot about the issue of agency in a world where you're thrown into conditions that are not of your own choosing. Obviously, Troy does a lot of work on um, analytic philosophy, and so there's you know people who are hardcore physicalists who would argue that even down to like the quantum substrata of our minds, you still can't justify free will and things like that. So there's this problem of agency that seems to emerge. So then my question is, okay, great. We, we all kind of acknowledge that, I think, on this podcast. Freedom in the libertarian sense is something that we should reject. Uh, freedom is something that's problematic in an age of um, – external compulsion that is kind of ubiquitous, right? And then it's just kind of looking at the variations or the various degrees of those impinging, compelling, um, coercive forces upon us and how do we navigate our agency within those confines. So then my question is, is are you not worried that sex work is still ultimately dominated by the transactional desires of the asymmetry and the court of men? And so that when women are engaged in sex work, there's still... And I don't want to just throw out this idea of like the patriarchy because I think that's such that, that's yeah. too easy of an escape. But nevertheless, there does seem to yeah. be a sort of sense in which the sex dynamic, as conditioned by the capitalocentric logic, as con- as conditioned by the sort of sense in which these women are selling their labor in relation to men, so they're still only given a secondary status. So are you ultimately worried that, yes, sex work needs to be protected now, but ultimately it would be great to get beyond the environment where women weren't economically, like, compelled to have to sell their bodies to men for the satisfaction of men so that they can just get money to eat food? Yeah, I mean, I think, so So there are so many different forms of sex work and circumstances in which it takes place that that's a, it's a difficult area to talk about in totalizing terms, right? Mm. So... So actually, um, in capitalist structures, it's, it's not necessarily the case that the consumer has any power or much power, right? So you in other the words, John? the John okay. as the yeah. consumer. Yeah, exactly. So, so in, the, in the framing that you just offered, it's, it's the John or the consumer that um, apparently has, has uh, an asymmetrically privileged power position. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Right. It may be well, I, I don't think at the individual level. But, I'm thinking at the structural level that that even right. The, but I think that yeah. yeah. No, no, go ahead. I just think there's so many different kinds of sex work and iterations 
<clears throat> of it that it's not possible to generalize, right? Okay. So there are definitely situations where, um, you know, the power differential is, is, is extreme and there are situations where it's less extreme. Um, and so the argument somehow that, well, if, if we were all just, you know, if we all had this sort of baseline level of um, socioeconomic stability, then no women would actually desire to sell their bodies for money. Like, so I object to that premise. Mm, okay. Basically. Yeah, right? yeah. Because so, lots of, I mean, there's so, in other words, there might even be, so there might be something non-economically productive about the moment of sexual exchange. And that we don't necessarily need full equality in the radical feminist sense or full freedom in the libertarian sense in order to recognize that fact. Mm. Yeah, I mean, are you, are, are you a reader of Simone de Beauvoir much? I mean, yeah, I'm kind of having to bone up on it now. Okay, I mean... The, but I don't want to project myself as some kind of expert on it. No, no, I, um, I mean, I'm not either. I'm, I am an expert on Sartre, but so my reading on de Beauvoir is sort of secondary. But, um, but one of the things I find... Well, so, she was all, always secondary to Sartre. Uh, she, unfortunately, she was. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Um, and she wrote a book called The Second Sex. Um, but obviously, it's the opposite. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, actually, there's like an amazing anecdote. Everyone thinks that like they had this this like torrid love affair and they were best friends and partners and stuff like that. And they were best friends and partners and she edited a lot of Nobody's his work. Nobody's best and... friends and partners. This is a big lie. Well, but the thing <laughs> is, apparently, apparently like the, the romantic like power or the romantic um, passion that they had for each other is oftentimes overstated. And apparently she actually had a passionate love affair with another individual who was really her like real passionate lover. Um, and then of course they had a threesome yeah. with one of their students and Shit like that. I mean, not just like an individual threesome, but they had a little menage. The good old days. Yeah, the good old days of of like freedom in France when when monogamy meant you and your partner and your mistress. Your PhD. <laughs> but uh, but no. So but de Beauvoir talks about this. This idea of you know she wants to yeah. espouse. She comes out of the existentialist tradition. She wants to espouse this idea of radical freedom, but it's a radical freedom that is in within conditions that are not of our choosing. And so she says, okay, so if if the female. Right sex is a secondary sex. It is something that is other to the primary sex, which is the masculine sex. How can you still have radical freedom from within that otherness? And when she says otherness, she doesn't mean necessarily oppressed. It can be oppressed. But one of the things that's interesting about her project is that she's trying to somehow take back a level of um, of freedom and uh, autonomy and power from within a recognition that we are in, you know, maybe we would say coercive material conditions. And I think yeah. there's something interesting in, in her project that, I, I don't know, when you were just talking a minute ago, it made me think of, of, uh, of her a little bit. No, I mean, that's intriguing. And I'm, again, like starting to work with her more. I mean, I'm, I'm loath to make grand pronouncements about that at this sure. point. But um, yeah, I mean, I think so that, I mean, on a baseline level, it seems obviously true, right? So nobody, the, the idea is not even, it's not at all. So I don't think we should be committed even to the aspirational notion that we could get beyond coercion. Like, why would we want to be beyond coercion? Like, what would that even mean? Do you know what I mean? So, mm. so the, prem the premising of coercive circumstances as normatively bad, as opposed to just like the frame that we exist within, um, is silly. Mm. And I think that's part of like the really the animating thing with this project is that like, look, you can achieve all sorts of substantively um, productive and may also maybe also um, simultaneously negative or problematic stuff because these things often go together but um a lot of really useful productive stuff can come out of situations that are obviously um trained and not evocative of freedom in the way that um we are ordinarily given to hmm. we should be looking for right mm -hmm. and i think and look and that's the law's basic premise too is that it's meant to like enhance individual freedom okay? why should it so yeah, so you the, the premise that the law is meant to enhance individual freedom is something that you would contest, um, absolutely outright. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Both in terms of like fact, but also aspirationally. Right. You know, because these are profoundly social interactions, like the most social interaction. Right. Sexual interaction, in other words. Yeah, I mean, I, I I guess I would say I tend to think that there is no such thing as individuality anyway, and I would think that even well, of course, yeah, yeah. even the mediating objects of language, for example, at the sort of like most yeah. maybe basic or simple, like even thoughts and consciousness, which are 
conditioned by language. Language is a social construct. Language words are not these individual things that I somehow have private access to, but they are these social terms that individually open up to these massive networks or constellations of meaning. And so when we uh, exchange them in a talk right now between three individuals, these mediating factors impose social demands upon us with how we can say them, how we can't say them, the meaning that we're articulating when we do say them, um, the the kind of intertextual references that are kind of all swirling around these ideas. I mean, people listening, their minds are probably racing and making connections, and they're thinking about people that they want to talk to or um, you know, some news article that this reminds them of. So there are all these like complex networks of of power relations, mm. relations of meaning and value that are essentially social, which means that even the very sort of bedrock of human consciousness is essentially a social activity. And so anything that mm. kind of like tries to homogenize or or reduce down to this very simple idea of individual rights, individual freedom, or the individual person is something that I'm I'm automatically skeptical of, but at the same time, I want to be sensitive, obviously, to issues that um, pertain to people who are kind of saying that they need help. And in, in a way that that's kind of what Me Too is doing. It's it's maybe an inflated maybe. cry of the oppressed in Marxian terms or something along those lines, no? Sure. I think it's a will to power. It, do you mean that in a negative way? I mean, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive. I don't know. Right. I mean, like there's, but I, but I, I don't know that. So like, I really have a problem with, Victimhood epistemology, right? Standpoint epistemology? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Um, uh, it's like inherently suspect, right? Because there's a political claim being made there. Um, and you, we need to be very transparent and articulate about the sort of political claim that's being made. Now, of course, like, whatever, there's, there's violation takes place. It's on a spectrum. Um, and you know, no one wants to, to deny, uh, real harm, which of course is part of all, you know, all of our lives, um, and often can have a sexual component and exists in the world. Um, but the idea that, you know, uh, a cry for, I don't know what you said, a cry for help could be articulated meaningfully, um, from the standpoint of the victim that wants to punish essentially which i think is really the main one of the main tenets of mm. me too ism so let's just call it an ism because mm. mm. <laughs> so i think it's actually more an ism than a than a you know movement or whatever i think that's really problematic so it's driven by a sort of punitivity a punitive logic which i think so yeah yeah, yeah because the question is right so how so these women right want to get back power that may be a completely legitimate desire for for many of them like i'm not delegitimizing that the question is how do you do that right and it's being done within a pers within a framework that understands power in exactly the kind of individual individualistic capitalistic um essentially non-social sense of individual freedom which is linked to um individual responsibility as well right so the law itself is highly tethered criminally but also just in general right? Not just the criminal law, all, all aspects of law is highly tethered to the notion of, um, of, uh, packaging and, 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 um, uh, uh, apportioning liability and responsibility for situations, um, on, on the basis of individuality, right? So we're very, very suspect, hmm. um, in Western, the Western goal standpoint the western legalism right is really really skeptical in general of notions of collective guilt or wrongdoing for example right we're much more comfortable with individualized guilt and wrongdoing um uh, and i think this is again like me too ism is one example of that there are many many others but 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 it's one example hmm. Do you not think that collective guilt sometimes comes into the conversation? Though it seems at least peripherally that it comes into the conversation. The idea that this is a, yeah. or just the idea of patriarchy itself, as problematic as that is. So how does that impinge on the discussion? Yeah. So yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so my intuition is actually that we're not like patriarchy is not really a meaningful way of 
think, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I'd have to think more about that. Do you guys want to say more about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I, so patriarchy, but patriarchy is not, so the only thing I, so my intuition there would be to say that patriarchy is, I think, asserted as a meaningful structural condition of reality within which individuals operate. Right. So I think that the responsibility question is still individualized and patriarchy is a structure that allows us to um, give meaning or make decisions about individual responsibility, but is not itself a form of collective liability. I think that would be my response. Yeah, that certainly seems to be the case in terms of even when the, the term patriarchy is bandied about in these discussions, it's more of an explanatory. Totally. Tool. Yeah. Like this is this is why this is happening mostly to women in the workplace or wherever it is. Um, whereas when you get into the, the, the legal realm and to the issues of responsibility, mm. even moral responsibility, it's it's heavily individualized. So it's almost like there's a parallax, yeah. a weird thing going on there where it's it's it exists only in one sphere and then gets totally erased when talking about responsibility. Yeah. That's really, really fascinating and helpful. So thanks for pointing that out. But so one one thing I would say, so there's been this like just to riff off of that, so that's super helpful. I think there's one um weird way in which so there is sensitivity with so of course Me Tooism is broad and has a lot of actors within it, right? And they're not all lean in weirdo feminists. Like <laughs> they're not you know what I mean? <laughs> So I think there are people in the ism that are, you know, committed um, progressives, whatever that means, or prog- committed leftists or people um, who are actually in other contexts really sympathetic to the kinds of critiques that, that we've all been making, right? Um, and so part of that has been to say, okay, uh, and, and this, is, this relates back to the, to the skepticism, this sort of paradoxical skepticism within the ism about the role of traditional law, right? So they'll say, look, we need to change the law, but we need to change the law, the criminal law, especially radically, because even when women resort to it, they find that their experience is manipulated and obscured and actually um, uh, rendered more harmful, like because of the procedures that the criminal law imposes, right? But that's I, probably true. Now, the question then is of what to do with that. And so some people, um, you know, really committed leftists, interestingly, have been calling um, for a different kind of approach. And and some of them have been saying, look, and this is an analog to the international arena where we um, where we are trying to to reckon with the idea that individual criminal responsibility in conflict, for example, is not necessarily the best way of addressing these issues. And so um, so the typical example in that context is to say, uh, take the route of South Africa and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? So we don't necessarily need a standard liberal legalist paradigm. We can do, uh, we can deal with these issues in a way that pays more attention to the collective nature of the social phenomenon um, and isn't necessarily punitive based. You guys follow me? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so the idea with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, as a form, so it's a form of what's known as transitional justice, right? So non-punitive, um, necessarily justice. So the idea is that you, um, there are many different ways this can be parceled out, but one of them would be to say, look, um, we understand that what, what the wrong uh, that happened in society was so widespread that it doesn't really make sense to put everyone in jail or to require everyone to pay a fine or whatever. What we really want is a collective reckoning with the situation which will require individuals to come before some kind of committee or body, tell their truth, and then in exchange for the truth and the therapeutic experience that that produces, we give them then amnesty from the traditional legal system in the sense that they won't be, they won't go to jail for their for their crime, right? So some people have put this, hmm. this has been something that I've seen consistently. Confession. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind yeah. of like a religious confession before a congregation in a way. Mm, absolutely. Like totally. It's mm. totally that. Right. So it's all, yeah, that's really, really helpful because then it, it sort of exposes the fact that all of this is premised in some kind of like weird Christian redemptive paradigm, right. Which also mm. we might want to get rid of, but, but um, so we can bracket that. I think that's true. It's, but there've been many calls for like, Oh, what we need, you know, um, if we're really progressives and leftists, but we're also committed to me Tooism, then what we need to have is some kind of truth and reconciliation commission. And then it's weird because it's like within the context of patriarchy, what would that mean? Like having all men, you know, <laughs> it's totally unclear what that would mean, but that's been put forward as an alternative to this punitive, um, bent that I've been, I've been highlighting. 
That would actually be a great TV show, though, right? I would watch that. <laughs> <TV show. laughs> yeah. Like, you, you have no idea yeah. when you're going to get called up. They just, like, show up at your house with cameras, and then you have to then <laughs> confess all of your patriarchal sins. Okay, would it be like the lottery where you have to draw a name out of a hat, and whoever gets the black circle is the one who gets uh, ostracized that week? <laughs> Well, it's like what not ostracized. I mean, the whole point is to reintegrate them into society, right? It's non ostracization. Well, in theory. But see, here's the, yeah, this is actually this is my problem with this. So, Freud has this notion yeah. of the more innocent you are, the guilty you are, the guiltier yeah, you course. are. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the, the thing that I think that, that is so interesting about this is the reason that this works is because let's think about this in terms of like the, uh, the altar of Me Tooism. The more yeah. piety that or the more confession that is infused into the power of this sort of transcendent metaphysical idea, the more innocence, the more power that is infused into it, whether it's just your own personal piety or whether it's more people that get incorporated into the system that infuse their piety into this thing, then the larger the god, let's say, of Me Tooism becomes, the larger this image becomes, which then means that the larger the debt demands are that are imposed upon the kind of material conditions underneath, which means that mm-hmm. the guilt mechanism is constantly expanding, even though you're quote unquote being good, because the demands of the the debt logic are being mm-hmm. inflated. And so this is one of my fears with this, is that this type of yeah. truth and reconciliation thing, as much as I, I like the idea of thinking of alternative forms of justice, like restorative justice or rehabilitative yeah. justice or something along those lines, um, I think we need to be really careful that we don't institute some new moral framework that creates these domineering hegemonic guilt structures over us because i think that's really damaging to us and and our subjective constitutions right so that's perfect i totally subscribe to all of that i think that's great that's a fantastic critique of the whole the whole impetus and it and doesn't get us any closer to, to yeah that's really really very helpful thanks so what do you think does get us closer to it what the fuck is a solution i don't so that's the whole thing. Like you can't, you need to have a fucking solution here. <laughs> that's the thing. Like this is the discussion I want us to have, right? So I want us to be able to say, like, oh yeah, you think it's easy to come with a, you know, a transitional justice mechanism that's going to fuck us up even more than throwing all the dudes in jail, right? For the well, reasons he- that you just articulated, right? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. You notice, like, you know, social media is a cesspool for negative affect, and one of the things I notice <laughs> a lot of is, um, is that a lot of people, and I don't know if it's, if it's like in jest or how much of it's in jest but my my concern is is that regardless of how snarky or humorous it's supposed to be the perpetuation of the memeing of like all men suck or men are shit or whatever or i hate men or down with the patriarchy even if this person is just expressing like man maybe they just got off the phone with their partner or with their brother or whatever and they're like fucking dudes you're assholes right whatever i mean dudes get together at bars and say shit man chicks are fucking crazy all the time right or um whatever people say shit all the time just to kind of express themselves but my concern is is that when you when you solidify it into like these digital memories and then people like it that that's like similar to like a prayer or it's similar to an amen or a hallelujah Mm -hmm. or like a pious infusion of doxa or glorying as Giorgio Agamben mm-hmm. would call it. Mm-hmm. And my, my concern is is that it just then creates these memory banks for negative mm-hmm. affectivity, which then gets spread out and then people kind of appropriate it. A- they appropriate this negative affect that may not have been there had they not been influenced, let's say compelled or even coerced by these social demands that are being imposed by their peer structure. And that's one of the things that, that kind of, I don't know, that kind of concerns me about this as well is, is the way that we're sharing this negative affect through the images that mediate our social relations. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, right? And it's being sold as uh, emancipatory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Completely yeah. So, bonkers. Right, right. And then at the same time, another part of me wants to just be like, well, maybe part of this also is because we think – that sex is precious and special and really it's not. And we need to just lo- loosen up. And then, but then I'm like, Oh, is that just dude logic? That's like, Oh, let's just fuck each yeah. other. You know? But I, you know what I mean? Like, I think there's something about this as well that like that, that there's like a preciousness about sex as well that we need to kind of dismantle. No, totally. So, so this is what I talk about. And just so um, in the frame, the framework of sex exceptionalism, which is huge in law. Right. Okay. And in, and because that, reflect society as well right so 
Um, so the idea that there's something, you know, in particular, there's a particular harm associated with assault, let's say, within the framework that we already have, um, something particularly bad about assault that has a sexual component, um, to me, again, is really something like you, you need to make a substantive affirmative argument for that. It might be true for some people. It might certainly be true that uh, society demands that of us. But the more that you reify that within concrete legal structures, the more it becomes true as well, right? Mm. Like the special harmfulness of, of sexual violence. And so, but I mean, this has been like a core tenant of, of radical feminism, um, you know, uh, for many, many years, right? That actually, that the whole idea of the patriarchy is, is not just men oppressing women, it's men oppressing women through sex. That's the whole notion, right? It's not even just, not just basic oppression, it's not even material oppression. Material oppression would be very interesting to talk about if like men were just oppressing women materially, that would be a different thing, but it's all premised on, on sex-based domination. Right. Mm. Um, and that's like nobody is questioning that. Very few people um, have been questioning that in the discourse. Right. And so I, I, I totally agree with you. Like I, I reject the notion that there's um, that that's true. Certainly that it's true today. Um, and I'm opposed to policy based solutions that encourage us to continue to think that that's actually the case. You know, and there's an analog like in my international work, there's an analog here. Right. This whole obsession um, and movement uh, around, uh, I think actually yesterday was the International Day to End Sexual Violence in Conflict. Actually, hmm. June 19th, it's like they had, there's a day for everything, but yesterday was a day for that. And, you know, and, uh, and the idea is that there's something in, particularly, in particular harmful about, about rape in wartime. And that not only that, but that it's disproportionate in, in a gendered and sexed uh, respect in the sense that it disproportionately affects women and girls, which is um, uh, uh, factually debatable um, and and normatively debatable as well. I think so. So this is not you know it's not I don't this is I don't think this Me Tooism is is new as such. I think it's an outgrowth of um, a whole bunch of stuff that's been lingering and unresolved and has been popping up in social conversations, um, you know, in a variety of different areas, um, including sexual assault and war. Yeah. And that was, you wrote that article, uh, where you talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about that article? Yeah. So, so, so I've been doing work for some time on, uh, on mass Soviet actually, but not just Soviet allied, but mostly Soviet, um, uh, instances of instances of rape and sexual violence against um, German civilian women um, in a specific period of time, like so, the final weeks of the war. Um, so the basic idea is that as uh, as Germany was was falling um, in April and May of 1945, uh, the Soviets were obviously sweeping westward, and there was this like race toward Berlin between the Americans and the Soviets. But um, but there were mass you know, uncontestably, based on evidence that we have, sort of mass rapes um, and other sorts of sexual violence exacted by the Soviets against these um, German civilian women um, and girls. Um, you know, and there's, and there's, so this has become, oh, there's many things to be said here, but this has become, interestingly, um, a really uh, big part of um, German social consciousness in the last, 10, 15 years in an interesting way. So there's a few things going on. There's one, there's the idea that um, these mass rapes had been actually silenced for many years. So the idea that um, it wasn't something that could be talked about publicly, which is sort of debatable. Um, and then also to go along with that, the idea that actually now we've got these revelations and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're suddenly in a position within German society um, where we're, he, you know, Germany has sufficiently atoned for its sins during the war or whatever. Um, and we're actually in a position where uh, we can acknowledge a degree of German suffering and victimhood during the war, as opposed to simply ascribing um, a totalizing paradigm of, of uh, perpetratorness to, um, to German society. And so, but what goes along, so it's, it's a really, it's a form of me-tooism, right? 
so it's become this, uh, it's, it's part of the social consciousness. There's been like several films about this, um, publications of women's diaries. I myself did a couple of, um, several actually interviews with who, uh, women who are now like very elderly um, survivors of various sorts of, of sexual violence. And um, what I wanted to point out in the piece was that the idea that giving voice, so this, the, the jargon of, uh, or the sloganeering rather, of Me Tooism, right? That we need to believe, hashtag believe women or give you know, voice to women's experiences. The idea that that, and that goes along with the silencing of men, right? Which, we, which we've seen time and time again, like whether it's Matt Damon or other people in the, in the, in the discourse, um, any man wanting to kind of push back um, or question just from a very simple, like not particularly insightful perspective has been immediately silenced. Um, so this is just a sort of an interesting analog where, um, where the same kind of thing is happening. And, but it's more, it's, it's, I wanted to point out sort of the really negative political um, consequences of this, this sort of standpoint epistemology, as you said, right? This idea that something meaningful um, is obviously going to come bubble up to the surface if we just um, listen to women. And uh, in this particular instance, uh, that is borne out by... Um, a sort of appropriation, for lack of a better word, by the alt-right within Germany of these narratives of sexual victimization in order to um, propel and support their overall cons very conservative, very um, xenophobic, very problematic political agenda, right? Okay. So, so it's been an important part of of um of the far right in germany to to really focus on this kind of german victimization and the idea that we didn't give proper space to it um as a way of of getting people on board with their projects um so that's mm -hmm. kind of the overarching that's kind of the, the argument of the piece and so i think um you know what i've been saying about i'm, I'm concerned like from a theory perspective with me too isn't but i'm also concerned from a practical perspective i do think that the theoretical constraints of the ism make it much more likely that we're going to end up in a scenario where uh, the material distribution of power favors a really regressive approach to sex mm. and sexuality. And that's the ultimate, you know, so, so of course I, I love theory for theory's sake, but, but I also think there's like really bad practical consequences that we should be concerned about. Right. And so you can see there are many ways in which we can see current uh, policy reforms like going in this direction that we can talk about as well. Uh, but one of one one really recent one um, that I also wrote about was so you will have you will recall um, the recent van attack in Toronto uh, yeah. with this guy. Yeah. So the, the guy who purportedly I think you probably talked to Amy when you had her on about about yep. the incels and all that. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. So. So, um, so that happened strangely, uh, in my city and whatever. And, um, and this guy was a, you know, involuntary celibate ostensibly. Um, and the quid, the big question and the big push from the me tours was to say, look, this has happened. What's our response going to be? It's an attack that used the means and methods of terrorism, uh, of quote unquote radical Islamic terrorism, as we've seen it in the past, namely a van attack to, atta um, to target directly target and intentionally target civilians in, in urban spaces, right? I've seen that in Berlin and Nice and Cannes and everywhere else. Um, and the idea, you know, the, the immediate policy proposal from the Me, Me Tours was to say, oh, well, this, we need to call this terrorism. We need to call this misogynist terrorism, right? And so Jessica Valenti and a whole, who's, you know, big on sex workers' rights and a whole bunch of other women were saying, the only way that we can, you know, objectively capture the heinousness of this act is if we include misogyny within the realm of prohibited political objectives that terrorists seek to advance. It's a hugely mm. problematic position for an obvious number of reasons, right? Which you can get into, but, but I think anytime we're, we're arguing about expanding the scope or the purview of terrorist activity, we'd want to be, you know, mm. especially from a left perspective. What are those, those practical consequences of, um, that are so problematic of calling this misogynistic terrorism? Well, I mean, I think terrorism has uh, so the idea of terrorism as a con is like so as a construct um, is to uh, it's a it's a it's a tool um, designed to take the substantive political claims 
of so-called terrorists off the discursive table, as it were, right? So anytime in the reason, so internationally, so if we're thinking about the global war on terror, right, and the ramping up and the resurgence of terrorist language in the last 20 uh, years or so, um, has been to say uh, that the activity, the political violence undertaken by so-called terrorists, whether they're Al-Qaeda or ISIS or whatever, is in and of itself always already illegal and normatively bad and should be punished and outlawed as such um, because terrorists target uh, the civilian population um, and, and it's because of that, right? Because of the way in which they exercise their violence um, that we're going to tell them their, their reasons for doing so um, don't need to be adjudicated, right? And so the flip side of that, because, and so terrorists in general, like in the broadest sense, attack the status quo, right? They're, re they're, they're revolutionary figures, right? They might be bad, right? but now we've seen this in the left. So left terrorism in the 60s and 70s was, was dealt with in exactly the same way, right? Call them, call whoever, the Red Brigade or whatever terrorists, and we no longer need to admit them as plausible political interlocutors, right? Mm. Um, it makes we're we're much happier to accept that today with respect to to Islamic terrorism because we substantively on the left or whatever don't like uh, you know the way that they want to organize society. But the fact of the matter is, terrorism has equally been used against other groups historically, namely um, leftist uh, revolutionary groups who are actually trying to challenge the status quo of the system. Right? Well, as far as I understand, so, the 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 kind of most concentrated amount of suicide bombers um, were actually mm -hmm. by Marxists, the Tam the Tamil Tigers or the Tamil Tigers. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, sure. So so um, yeah. I I mean, in terms of just raw numbers or or kind of ratios and things like that. So it, yeah, it I is mean, kind I'm very skeptical term. of numbers and this, these kinds of indicators, but I but I'm not. So look, so there's a lot of that, right? Like for sure. Right. So terrorism is something that's been available for a long time. It's been a discourse that's available for a long time. It's simply been. Um, resurrected in the last 20 years and deployed against a new set of people and easier for us on the so-called left, uh, if that's who we are, to swallow because, um, you know, because we don't like that women's rights are being violated, you know, by ISIS or whatever, right? So, 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 but really what's going on is that, um, is that the terrorism, terrorism is just a form of political violence. Right. We can disagree with the politics of these groups and individuals um, exercising terrorist means. But my, from my perspective, we should do so on the basis of their politics and not on the basis of the way in which they try to make their political claims heard, if that makes sense. And so, you know, and the flip side of that is that call, making t the terrorist the you know enemy of all mankind or whatever. Right. Um, allows for a whole host of other violations of again, admittedly within the liberal legalist paradigm that we live, but all sorts of due process and other violations of individuals, individual rights um, in the system, right? So you can send people to Guantanamo Bay and keep them there indefinitely because they're terrorists. Um, mm. It's not clear to me that dealing with misogyny to the extent that it exists systemically will be uh, aided at all by, call, by just t calling it terrorism. It's not going to be helpful. It's not going to solve the problem. It'll probably make it worse. So the idea then is that you, obviously we object to the means as well, right? Obviously mm -hmm. you shouldn't drive van, vans into people, right? Everyone agrees with sure. that. Um, but that calling it terrorism or sort of combining the misogyny, which is sort of the, I guess, the, the political um, belief animating or motivating mm -hmm. the action and then terrorism is sort of the means. Combining those two things together to make them like a special instance is the issue. And instead we should just we shouldn't make it a special instance. It should be an instance of violence. Yeah. I mean, this guy committed 10 instances of murder and something like 16 instances of attempted murder. And he's been charged with those crimes. And that's from the system that we're operating in seems to me to be fine. Um, I don't think we need anything different. I don't, it's not going to help. Look, the, the criminal law in general is very bad at solving social problems. Right. Very, very bad. So all of the criminal law is a, in general, a very bad way of, of um, orchestrating like a just and, um, you know, equally distributed society, right? So let's acknowledge that from the, yeah. from, you know, the get-go. Well, that, that seems to be and the then, crux of the whole issue, right? Is both yeah, from Me Too exactly. and from everything else, it's trying to use the law, which is a tool, as you said before, right? To solve social issues. And yeah, it's very bad. What's the, what's the mechanism that's supposed to do that? Even from the 
from the, the Me Too side or from the radical feminist side or whatever it is. It's just supposed to naturally happen. No. And look, look, I'm not, I'm saying the criminal law is a very bad tool for all of the individualistic reasons. So I'm, I myself am opposed, am impo- like this is, I know that this is an extreme position, but I am opposed to the criminal law. I think we should abolish it in general. I don't think it's a, it's an appropriate way of organizing. Um, I do think that um, many of the problems, the social problems that we're trying to rectify can be dealt with through other avenues of legal redress. So the criminal law is just one aspect of the law, right? There are many other ways in which the law organizes, uh, you know, who has bargaining power in labor situations, uh, who gets, you know, free education, who gets redistributed money when we're taking time, you know, whatever. Like the law orchestrates all of social life, right? It's everywhere, literally everywhere. We just go around, you know, oblivious to this fact, but it's literally everywhere. Like I'm looking at, you know, a bottle of water that says it's come from a certain place and whatever, and all, all of that's, you know, <laughs> orchestrated by law. So there are many ways, of, I mean, the, our main problem, I think, is from the perspective of different sorts of misogyny, um, to the extent that it exists, is trying to figure out ways of increasing, um, like, wealth in the largest possible um, sense of that word, and um, political power of women, which does it isn't dependent on on calling an activity a terror a terrorist activity, and isn't dependent on putting people in jail, but it is dependent on ensuring that um, individuals in society uh, have some kind of equal playing ground, right? So just ensuring like um, basic social safety nets, um, health care, um, legalizing sex work, uh, so that those workers are able to benefit from um, the labor rights regime, all of those things would actually do something to remedy um, the sorts of problems we're talking about, but, but certainly not um, labeling that particular activity um, misogynist terrorism. <laughs> Silence. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, because I, 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 I think, so when Amy was on the podcast, one of the things we talked yeah. about is the, the problem is kind of similar to what Troy mentioned earlier about the idea of patriarchy as being reduced to this causal agent. Similarly, misogyny is oftentimes, with regards to the incel culture, is yeah. is this monster, like this autonomous causal yeah. monster that is driving these people who are, you know, living in these subreddit forums, wherever the fuck they are, and um, and it's like this over psychologization of something that that requires a, a much deeper sort of critical analysis of what's going on, of what's what's leading to uh, a misogynistic disposition. And totally. because I'm because I don't believe in the existence of essences anyway, particularly when it comes to humans. And I believe that humans are extremely malleable, not just at the biological level with like neuroplasticity, but 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 across the board, let's say at the phenomenological level, I, I believe that human beings are ever in a process of transformation. And so I just my gut reaction is is when when we're so quick to slap a formal label onto um this field of difference, what ends up hap- happening is it, it it radically stifles and limits any possibility for transformation or growth or for flux. And and again, I think that fits into this this capitalocentric logic because that's one of the things that capitalism essentially does is it homogenizes, it simplifies, it hegemonizes, and mm-hmm. the the supposed idea that you can have a counter hegemonic left that wouldn't fall into the same traps as the dominant restrictive hegemonic quote unquote right or status quo i think is is a complete misunderstanding of what hegemony itself does and is i think it essentially is restrictive it's essentially limiting and limited it's it's, it's essentially reactive and i'm not sure that if we're going to really concern ourselves with building a better society if we're going to concern ourselves with creating social harmony of um, eradicating oppression, exploitation, anxiety, and trauma to the best of our abilities, the best that we can. I just don't think that counter-hegemonic strategies are the way to go. I don't know. I think it's actually quite counterproductive to the goals of of a, a leftist orientation, which should be the sort of release of the radical flows of potential creation that exist at the margins, that exist outside yeah. the system. 
You know, the subaltern voices, the post-colonial voices. It's listening to them, not to bring them into a new counter-hegemonic logic, but to learn from them that exist outside the, the kind of status quo so that we can create on the margins, moving forward, bursting the margins, and and, and kind of moving forth in, in a radical creative freedom. Yeah, so I, I, I think I basically subscribe to all of that. I mean, I do worry a little, and I worry about this in my own thoughts, so that's why I'm saying this, because I, I worry that we have this tendency to be like, okay, there's an inside and an outside, and there's this um, radical potential on the outside, and what we need to do is figure out a way of getting it on, on the inside somehow, um, but not allowing it to become hegemonic. And so, I, I mean, I'm just not sure what to do with this, this notion of inside outsideness. I mean, it seems to me that what I'm actually, I mean, I, I really think there's a value to, I mean, I don't really even like that, that uh, spatial organization idea, but like an idea yeah. of, of like, how do we live in the margins? You know right. what I mean? Without, without, or, or it, it, I'm, so this is, this and it sounds ex- extremely articulate, I realize, but I, t- I talk in one of the pieces about the idea of like liminal, liminality right. as a productive space and not a space you know, and, and the, of course, paradox there is that it needs to be liminal in order to be productive. And so therefore I can't, you know, right. um, I'm not sure what to do with that, but I think in general, I subscribe to everything you just said. Well, see, I tend to think that actually that, that again, this is one of the things I work through is, is I don't want to overly essentialize, but if there is a sense in which there is a human essence, part of it has to do with the fact that we are linguistic beings, at least, um, to what extent I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, but, but at least part of it means that we are th- we, that we are sociolinguistic beings. And I actually think that that kind of betrays any sort of absolute possibility for l- living beyond the liminal restrictions. I think that there will always be this interplay of the yeah. flux and flow of life that that exists excessive of our codes, but at the same time, language essentially is coding. Now it's coding yeah, and yeah. and decoding simultaneously. So I think that that maybe we need to adjust our expectations. And and I think yeah. that maybe part of the reason that that we're betrayed by our own sort of linguistic images is because we're still stuck within a post-Christian paradigm that views teleologically this idea of heaven as being this final end state. And we're still thinking in terms of linearity right. and progress and that there's this ultimate goal that we'll reach where in communism everything will be fine and you know sex workers will they won't have to sell their labor but they'll just do it for fucking fun and the pleasure of making some extra cash so that they can yeah. go to the amusement park on the weekend or whatever the fuck these fantasy ideas that we that we maybe unconsciously reproduce that sort of domineer over our our social activism and our theorizations i think maybe we need to kind of worry about or, or work on sort of breaking these larger future images down as much as we can. Not that we'll ever be able to get rid of it because, again, language maybe betrays our abilities to, to think radically free anyway. But but at the same time, no, maybe there's a way we... No, I don't think that's true, we... yeah. No? No, go ahead. Well, no, no, no. So I agree with you, but I think so So this from a semiotic perspective, right? Like the, um, I, why can't we... I, I think you're, I actually agree we should be happy in the knowledge that you know, uh, the signifier is never going to capture the signified. And that's actually the cool thing about language or the cool mm-hmm. thing about communication. You know, and I think like in it just, and again, this is anecdotal and, you know, individual, but like the process that for my own experience anyway, it's not like, like thinking about a thing is actually thinking. It's, ex- it's the expression of the thing. So the, it's, it's the, in the conversation or in the process of writing that you arrive at meaning. Not truth, certainly, but you arrive at, at, at meaning in that processual thing, which is, of course, um, inherently, as I think you're right, because we're linguistic beings is inherently social. And that's the kind of thing that needs to be supported mm. and also just lived with. And I hate this, this is going to sound completely ridiculous and trite, but if m- mindfulness were ever to have some kind of importance, it might be in some sort of idea like that. Well, I mean, as much as mindfulness can also create docile bodies that are just Mm. better exploitable workers, at the same time, I think (laughs) one of the things that it can do is it can scramble your connection to your rigid identification of yourself. And Troy and I are working through a book on the podcast right now where uh, this guy is trying to posit this idea of the void as this universal concept that will allow for us to reconceive of how we do world politics and things like that. And so there's there's all these different ideas. You know, you have the ideas of the real in, in Lacanian psychoanalysis. You have the idea of the real in, in like Zizekian ontological 
psychoanalytic metaphysics or whatever. And so there's these ideas always of the excess that's bursting forth. And and for me, I'm, I'm really influenced by Gilles Deleuze and this idea of like these created unbounded flows or lines of flight or whatever. And and you get this maybe in like Foucault too with this idea of the this endless possibility of technologies of the self, of kind of like working on yourself and the care of the self. And there's this perpetual po- process of like deconstructing your own identity and not, again, being so precious about the identities that we claim for ourselves and that it's okay to be in this state of disruptive process. Yeah, I, don't I couldn't know. agree more. And the question yeah, is, is can we right. do that with our sexual practices? And I think we can. Well, I think exactly. that, I think essentially that's what sexual practice is. I think it is deconstructive. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's so it's the, it's the um, fact of that, right, that's being lost in, 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 the, in, the, in the desire for regulation that we already have and of in the fact of regulation that we already have and it's very very i think it's endangered in very very worrying ways um in some of the prescriptive attitudes of me tooism and also just the theoretical orientation of me tooism that we just described right from my perspective that's the whole problem with me tooism is that it's, it's against everything that you just described it's mm. against that sort of orientation it's very worried about ascribing that that about accepting the fact or ascribing um that kind of potentiality to the sexual act to bring it back to the thing we're talking about originally in the beginning is the mean Too movement seems to have this sort of background of a subject a liberal subject which just expresses some inner truth or essence and it happens to be through you know more market logic that we're talking about today but that can happen in all sorts of different arenas and this sort of uh scrambled subject that we're talking about is more realistic this is what people are actually like they don't have inner essences that they express they sort of discover who they are through processes and those processes change and they don't have some stable essence that survives through time and um if that if that subject is more in tune with with reality and how we actually exist then we're gonna have to reconceive what notions of expression or what notions of desire and all these different things that are become legal terms um yeah. in practice and we have to regulate them legally we have to i mean it's just it's just going to be part of human life when oh, you sure. have imbalances of power yeah. and so yeah i mean i guess is what you're saying not necessarily just we should throw everything out that we've ever done and uh the me too movement's entirely based upon pure world of power and that's and just that but instead just to say look we have to reconceive these notions because we don't have um, the proper idea or the proper realistic idea of what it is to be a human being at the center of them. Yeah, I think that's totally right. Hmm. And to the extent that there is some kind of, you know, uh, like the intuition that sex is exceptional, I think it would be um, in its perhaps, again, I'm not going to be fully committed to this right now, but in its perhaps kind of unique ability to actually allow for this sort of scrambled subjectivity, right? As opposed to like, I, th- I think that, you know, and that maybe that's why we treat it so, and we want to regulate it and cabin it as intensely as we do, because it's that sort of threatening potential, as opposed to um, the articulated threatening potential, which is about, you know, harming an individual's integrity or bodily uh, dignity or whatever, right? Well, I say let's uh, let's let's that's a good note for us to stop the talk and, and wrap things up. Right. Uh Troy, do you have any final questions or was that kind of your way of whooping, whipping us back to, uh, <laughs> what is it, like doing the, the, getting us back onto the rabbit trail or the, from the rabbit trail? Ouroboros, whatever it is. Your yeah, whatever tail. it is. <laughs> no, that was, that was all really great. I'm still personally thinking through a lot of these things at the very kind of surface level and trying to dig, to dig deep to find what the, what the sort of, what the fossils are, like what they're doing like the archaeological yeah. um, process. So this has been really helpful for me. I'm, I'm really glad we did this and um, hopefully it will just spur us on to think more about um, how we have to reconceive these notions of subjectivity and legal power and stuff like that, which I, I really appreciate that you, that you couch it in that way, Heidi, because uh, I'm sure you get a lot of criticisms, but just kind of assume that you're just calling everybody who's involved in me too, a bunch of bitches and they should stop whining. <laughs> Um, but in but in a more like fancy with more fancy language, yeah. But no, th- this seems much more rooted in a hey, we actually have much deeper issues that need to be addressed, um, rather than just like a critique of like the formalism or or something like that about me too. No, I think that that's totally right. Yeah, thanks. This has been incredibly helpful for my own my own thought process. 
So thank you very much to both of you. And yeah, I mean, fuck, really we'll have to we'll have to get you on. When uh, you're working on this project now, is there a mm -hmm. deadline when this one will be done? Uh, well, you know, it's my writing summer, so <laughs> I'm hoping by the end of the summer to have you know pretty substantial substantial progress. Cool. Well, maybe we can get book. you back on uh, to kind of capstone uh, or to bookend <laughs> uh, to bookend your research project. Um, is there where can people find you on the internet or your publications and things like that? What what do you want to plug? Sure. Um, so I'm on Twitter at Heidi um, underscore underscore Matthews. So two underscores because the one underscore is like a sex bot. <laughs> it's an inactive account, but it's the mistake has been made many times. Um, <laughs> so I'm on Twitter at that handle, um, which I use pretty frequently, I guess. And then, um, yeah, so if people are interested, they can check out the publication that... Um, that I had from a couple of months ago in Aeon, um, and then also the the piece about misogyny and terrorism appeared um, originally um, in the conversation, but then taken up in a few other publications. And then the um, the World War II Soviet rape piece also was in originally in the, in the conversation. Awesome, cool. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Heidi. We really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. And enjoy Italy uh, out there drinking cappuccinos and smoking cigarettes and eating pasta and whatever else you're doing. <laughs> it's pretty delightful. Thank you. All right, sweet. So our next segment of the episode is the Sticky Leaves segment. And for those of you who are new, the reason it's called the Sticky Leaves segment is because of a book by Dostoevsky called Brothers Karamazov, and one of the characters, is it Ilya? Ivan. 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 Uh, has this conversation with his brother, where his brother is basically saying, well, if you don't believe in God, where do you find meaning in the world? And Ivan says something along the lines of, it's the sticky leaves. What is it, Troy? Your sticky leaves on a Sunday morning or some shit like that? Yeah, and you trample them with your foot, and they make all those crumply noises. Yeah, and that's the meaning that you find in a world that is often devoid of some sort of transcendental signified that you derive meaning from. So this is the segment one of us tells what's giving us meaning in a world that is devoid of meaning. So T-Roy, what's your sticky leaves this week? Dude, your shitty minute was heavy as fuck. Uh, and the conversation yeah. we just had with Heidi was was pretty intense as well. So we're going to talk about so, LeBron going to the Lakers? <laughs> no, I talked about basketball uh, recently, so I can't do that. And, uh, but oh, once, okay. once uh, Kawhi Leonard gets traded to the Lakers and they sign LeBron and Paul George and the Lakers beat the Warriors and win 80 games, then I'll have that as my sticky leaves. Um, <laughs> I'm keeping it simple right now. Real simple. One of my favorite shows, TV shows just finished up, The Americans on FX. Did you watch that at all? No, but I heard, like, series finale, right? Like, it's done-done. Yeah, it's done-done. Yeah. I never watched it. Yeah, it was a fantastic show. It just finished up. It's, you know, considered prestige drama, and it'll probably go down as one of the greatest TV shows of this generation, I would think. Really? Yeah, it definitely will. It's very critically acclaimed. Um, not very oh. heavily watched. It certainly wasn't um, uh, a moneymaker for FX. But, um, sure. They're pretty good at keeping shows on even though they don't make a lot of money like legion and i think even atlanta is not that popular in terms of pure uh you know quantified numbers just raw numbers yeah yeah so the americans was really great it wasn't the perfect show there were problematic aspects to it but i just want to recommend to anybody out there who wants a pretty bingeable show that's also pretty deep and interesting and unique this is a pretty good one to go on it's like five or six seasons um, it's very well written, very well acted. And I really want to just kind of point out the uniqueness of the show as one of its calling points. Um, the basic setup of the show is you have two Soviet uh, spies in the 80s who um, exist in America, in Washington, D.C., right in the uh, Beltway. And they have a family and their kids are both American because they're born in America. And of course, they masquerade as being American citizens. Um, and they uh, sort of act as uh, what the FBI called the illegals at the time, I guess, which were these Soviet agents who masqueraded as Americans and, and spied on um, different American government agencies and over nuclear weapons and all sorts of different issues. And so it's a pretty common setup. We've seen lots of movies that are about these issues, and it seems pretty boilerplate. But the show really takes from an inter interesting angle because – 
it's about the spies. It's about them and they're communists and they believe in communism and they have discussions about communism and capitalism and how they grew up um, hmm. during the end of uh, wartime in the Soviet Union and grew up poor and impoverished and wanted to serve their country and come to America. And they sometimes appreciate some of the things that are different about American capitalism while simultaneously thinking that it's immoral. And they have interactions with Black Panthers who are friendly to communism and who want to, um, you know, eventually overthrow American government and various things. And it's, it's all done very interestingly and from this unique perspective. And um, one of my favorite thing, I, not my favorite thing, but one of the I think awesomely unique things about this show is these two communists who are also very sort of clear on their atheism. Um, that's obviously a big thing in the 80s, right? During Reagan's presidency and Christianity mm. in America versus the great evil. That's the atheist Soviet Union. Um, they, their daughter at one point becomes an evangelical Christian. Um, mm. Becomes really into like Bible studies and youth groups and stuff like that. And then they have these discussions about Christianity and all these kind of things. And um, they actually like, I think at some point, like rip up a Bible <laughs> in anger. <laughs> it's like, dude, the main protagonists on a cable TV show in America in the year 2000, I think it was like 16 at the time, ripped up a Bible <laughs> like on screen. Like, dude, like yeah. that's, that's pretty unique, right? <laughs> like you wouldn't ever see that on like a network a TV show, I don't think, by no. a protagonist. It would maybe by Can like the, imagine? the evil villain. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty unique, right? Um, and yeah. then they have discussions about how they actually kind of come to terms with their daughter's Christianity because she cares about the social aspect of it and the social, the social gospel aspect is what kind of drives her desire mm. for becoming a Christian. And so they kind of end up being cool with it and like finding common ground. Like this is all just like interesting stuff that I really appreciate um, about the show. I really loved it. I would recommend it to anybody who enjoys good dramatic television. It's suspenseful. It's interesting. It's well acted. Uh, it's not going to change the world, you know, but uh, right. it's really good. Is it the uh, the the woman that was the lead in Felicity? Yeah, Carrie Is Russell. Carrie Russell, that's her name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is she one of the spies? Yeah, yeah. She's the she's the mother wife. Okay. Huh. And who who else is in it? Na any names that I would know? Um, probably not names you would know, but Matthew Rice is the is the husband father, and they're actually okay. married and have kids in real life now. Carrie Russell and Matthew Rice. Oh no shit. Okay. Yeah, they met on the show and then kind of fell for each other, or whatever. Yeah. And um Yeah, I don't think anybody else in the show is like a is like a big name. Well, Carrie Russell, uh, I hope it works out for you, but there's a saying, don't shit where you eat. So <laughs> But the show's over, so I guess that's okay. It's okay. Yeah, they survived this long, so Okay, good. good hey, good, maybe good. maybe like kicking each other's asses sometimes ends up, you know, being kind of sexy. That's just how it works. It, it's, fuck, we just talked about that. I mean, we didn't get to, into it too much, but, you know, Heidi was involved in a debate or a discussion about um, choking and strangulation in the context of sexuality. There's actually a really long thread on Twitter that people can find based – that actually her and our former guest that we had on, Amy uh, Therese, talk about in response to an article by Kate Mann or Kate Mann, M-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Do you know her? She's a philosopher mm -hmm. at Cornell University. I don't. Um, but uh, yeah, it was an article where she is writing in opposition to um, strangulation and, and or maybe it's not an opposition to it as like a sexual practice, but um, it's, uh, it's about sort of instituting re like more restrictive legal parameters um, over strangulation or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, I guess the way that it was worded, Heidi and Amy were critical of it. So if you want, go check that shit out on Twitter. You can just like Google Kate Mann, M-A-N-N-E, and then maybe Amy, and it's A-I-M-E-E, -E, and then maybe Heidi in Twitter, and I'm sure it'll come up somehow. So uh, just search that shit on Twitter. But I don't know what that has to do with the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. This is actually kind of my reason for the sticky leaves in the first place, and I forgot about it, was there was an article written by a guy who writes um, or sort of consults for the writers of the Americans, and he is a, uh, a Russian guy who I guess grew up under the Soviet Union, came to America uh, before the Union fell, um, 
And so his sort of his understanding of Russian is sort of couched in the Soviet style and not okay. in the post-Soviet style, which I guess the language evolved in certain ways um, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And so they brought him on to be a consultant because they wanted um, they didn't want someone who just speaks like 2015 or whatever Russian. They wanted okay, someone yeah, who makes speaks sense. the old Russian um, <laughs> so that the characters, when they speak Russian and this show set in the 80s, would have an, an accurate uh, dialect, right? Oh, cool. Was the idea. Um, and there's this article that where he kind of, after the, the show ends, it's in the New Yorker by a guy named Masha Gessen. And it just details like his own experience uh, as a kind of child growing up in the Soviet Union and then coming to America, which is similar to how they, how the characters in the show did, although, you know, they're spies, so it's a little different. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it's in the New Yorker. It's a really fun, sh- really short little article detailing this stuff out and just kind of speaks to, I think, the quality of the show. Um, and that they they spent all this time trying to make sure that every Russian word was was sort of correctly placed, which of course n- nobody in America is going to actually care about, right? Unless you actually yourself are part of this point zero zero one percent who has the same experience. Um, right. But I thought it was pretty damn cool. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to like, you know what? You're going to create this thing, and we're going to make it quality, even if no one cares about it. Yeah, and that's just cool from the perspective of being a creator or an artist, right? That you can really buy into shit like that. And actors love that kind of shit. They love that kind of shit. You know, they're like, "Ooh, it's the authentic Russian from the old guard." Oh, they would fucking buy their. It would get them more in tune with their character. You know, when they're going through their process of uh, of developing him or her. So yeah, that's fucking cool, man. Yeah. So watch the Americans. It's good. Sweet. Well, that is going to do it for us this week. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thank you to Heidi. Next week, we're going to jump back into our book club. Where we're going to look at Chapter 2 of World Politics, Void Universalism 1 by Sergei Prozorov. In the meantime, please feel free to hit us up uh, and follow us on Twitter. It is owls underscore at underscore dawn. You can also email us at owls at dawn podcast at gmail.com. And if you could head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and a review, that would really help us out. You can also go to our website, owls at dawn.com, and you can check out our episodes in the backlog, uh, the back catalog of episodes. Or you can comment and uh, you can ask us questions and we can engage with you there as well. Am I leaving anything out? Just one thing, dude. What is that? Das Vidani, Amerikanski.
Hello, hello, check, check. Oh, me too. Yes, yes.